cryptid called the Dover Demon. It kind of looks like it's like a small gremlin-like creature, okay. um, almost, but very alien. It has like three strong fingers. It, it's um, and it lives out in the mountains, and they're crying, or if like they hit like if they hit the fetal position, or if they just drop, or if they're running and falling. You're having a response to this that is not that is not one of enjoyment. They see this large creature as I described in the middle of the road. They turn around and drive back into town, hitting speeds of 100 miles per hour. And they're looking back at this creature. The wings aren't moving or flapping. They're just staying so, They're staying the same, like it's gliding. But it's still keeping up at 97, and it's scratching the roof, the hood of their car, you know? Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gordy Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about. From spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two, one trick or one treat. It's Halloween week here on Mamwa and if you love all things dark and spooky, we have got a great chat for you today. So from working as an actor in haunt experiences and then creating artwork, which is haunting, to his knowledge of Mothman lore, we are joined by Halloween-focused creative, who is hopefully going to creep us out a little or a lot for a Halloween thrill this week. Brett Kelly, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, not bad. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And like We're talking about some of my favorite things, so I'll try and slow down because I get I tend to speed up when I get really excited. So oh, <laughs> here we please go. Please be excited. <laughs> we love that. Um, so... I'm looking forward to our chat today. I I personally have got a lot to ask you. I'm a massive fan of horror films, so I'm quite excited about some of these topics. Um, yeah. And I'm sure the listeners also want to know a lot about you and your work, as well as all the scary stuff that we're going to get into. So sure. I, I guess, firstly, let's let's just get started with you, really. Where are you from? Mm-hmm. Where Whereabouts in the world are you? What's it like? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I hail from Massachusetts in the United States of America. Um, uh, yeah, Massachusetts kind of like we were just talking in the preamble that uh, Massachusetts is home of you know Boston, Massachusetts, um, and also Salem, where the say where the notorious historical Salem witch trials happened. And like, uh, and this time of year in the states uh, and for September and October, Salem kind of becomes like the Walt Disneyland for goths and scary people. So. Um, we're right. Like I'm definitely right at home. I'm on the opposite side of the state, but uh, all the all the um, <laughs> everyone from New England kind of flocks to uh, to the state of Massachusetts during this time of year to watch the leaves change because it's uh, really pretty. So, um, but yeah, that's where I'm from in the United States. I'm also uh, an artist. Um, I work a day job, but I also do all sorts of stuff like graphic design, tattoo design, industrial design. If it has design in the title, I've touched it. Um, I do a lot of uh, a lot of illustration type of stuff, traditional hand-drawn, uh, traditionally uh, traditionally taught. I uh, got my Bachelor's of Fine Art and Illustration from the University of Connecticut and i um, 40 years old. And then I spent about 15 years in the haunt industry um, where I was, I also spent some time as a stunt performer at a, at a stunt show that was in New England and got blown up by Batman five times a day. So that was really fun way to spend my summers for a little while. Yeah, great. it's a great <laughs> sentence that you get to pull out. Not a lot of people get to, it's, it's a good bingo card one. Um, but yeah, and then through that job, I uh, really started getting into doing makeup and doing horror stuff. And I do concept artwork for uh, for indep- independent cinema and film and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, do a little bit of everything. I, I'm lucky in that I have a lot of talented friends that think my work is uh, worth uh, investing in and utilizing for their projects. So, I'm, yeah. So that's that's fantastic. <laughs> so you, you mentioned something close to Salem are you in the area yes. of Salem nope uh, I'm on uh, uh, I mean Salem is about two about, on a on a good day if traffic isn't bad it's about a two and a half hour drive away from okay from me. so yeah but it's I'm on the opposite side of the state so it's like um like Massachusetts kind of has like the arm where like Cape Cod is and Boston's kind of smack dab in the middle Salem's right up above it and on the other side of the state is where I'm at um which is very boring looking it's just a square 
but uh but it's a, it's a really nice place um there's a huge tri-county thing called B, the Big E that's happening right now and that's like i think <clears throat> it's basically a gigantic fairground where like representatives of all the new england states kind of gather around and it's a whole big food it's like a gigantic festival and like um like harvest festival type of thing but there's like carnival rides and all the fried food you can think of and every year there's some diabolical thing that'll raise your cholesterol just looking at it um so that's that's in full swing and i think they just broke an attendance record of like 120,000 people in one day on saturday so it's like it's getting up there in numbers so that's that's underway that's where that's where i'm at right now that's where i live and before I forget to ask then, because we're about to break it down into a lot of stuff you've already said. Um, sure. So before we get into that, is there anything Halloween, spooky, Salem style that's happened in your area? Well, the I live pretty close to the amusement park where I spent most of my time uh, working as um, working as uh, as a haunt attract as a haunt actor. Um, so that's more of like the entertainment side of, of spooky, scary. However, I do believe um, if you're talking about like local folklore and cryptids and stuff like that, or like scary stuff that happens, there is a regional cryptid called the Dover Demon that is uh, that is located around here, and it's and it kind of looks like um, it kind of looks like it, it's like a small gremlin-like creature, okay. um, almost but very alien and has like three pronged fingers. It, it's um, and it lives out in the mountains. Um, I know that's probably one of the more prominent ones that are in the area for us. Um, yeah, I'm just tell I'm me again. To tell me again. What's yeah. it called? The Dover Demon, because it's Dover in the, Dover, Demon. Massachusetts. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. The, yeah, for the alliteration, but yeah, it's kind of like it's almost like um, it falls under the category. Like I found, like for for my cryptid knowledge, like cryptids tend to fall into like three or four different categories. One is like your your hairy, you know, your hairy big like prime primate creatures. So you have your yeti, your sasquatch, your bigfoot, your skunk ape, your um, uh, others, others that are like that. And then you have your small gremlin-like creatures that are like um, Hopkinsville goblins. The Dover demon falls into that. Um, uh, to uh, Tommy knockers, I think, is another term for them. Uh, Puckwudgies. Um, and then there's other ones that kind of are more like, more like more like creepy humanids where you have like mothman and then you have like um like the goat man and stuff like that that are kind of spread out all over the place and ones that are more re re relevant to animals like loch ness um but yeah and then there's a couple others that are just more like extraterrestrial in nature where you have one so those are like the three or four that i try and break them down into ours we get a goblin like one in in new england so that's so interesting so when did when did your love of all things Halloween and spooky come about? When did it start? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I was, uh, my birthday is in November, so it's just after the Halloween. And actually, legend tells it, as my parents have told me, I was supposed to have been born on, on Halloween proper. But uh, unfortunately, I slept in. And I think also <laughs> my parents were like, we don't want to have, we don't, like, I'm the first born of three sons, so I think my parents were just like, eh, maybe we don't want to have our kid be born on Halloween. Maybe we can just, maybe we can just avoid that. And then, now that I've grown up and they've seen how I've become, they're like, oh, it, you, of course you should have been born. Makes complete but, sense, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You live and you learn. Um, but I also, you know, I'm bad, I'm bad at waking up anyway, so it was also on brand for me. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, I always used to draw, like, scary stuff growing up, too. Like, that was just, like, a thing that I gravitated towards. A lot of skeletons, a lot of, you know, monsters and stuff. And then um, I really, my love of it really came into, like, what it is now when I was in college. Um, when I was, because I, I became a martial arts instructor in high school. Um, and then, which which is why that lent me into becoming a stunt performer at a local amusement park that's around here. And that same amusement park they would normally do like their haunted their haunted season their haunt attraction season for you know for september and october and uh so they liked me enough that they were like yeah you you, you know you get blown up by superheroes really well you want to come and make people scary like you draw it can you have you ever drawn on a face and i was like i i haven't and they were like we can show you i'm like sign me up so yeah that begat so uh, did begat the haunting scary. then yeah. did that come was that a spontaneous thing that happened because you were at the amusement park or did you actively yes. go looking for that? I didn't actively go looking for it. I, I fell into it just okay. because, uh, um, yeah, because I fell into the right crowd. Like the amusement park that I worked at was a really core, cool core group of creative people. 
And uh, it was just a really awesome um, environment to just kind of be creative. So I would, you know, I've done everything from, you know, running the makeup room to uh, scaring people in haunted attractions, like walk through indoor attractions. And I've also been like um, what they call like a midway character, which is basically you're just in a full costume in full 360 degrees on the midway interacting with people like as a wandering goat, uh, as a wandering monster and stuff like that. And uh, I, I, had a lot of I was given a lot of freedom after they found out that I was trustworthy that uh I would come up with like a bunch of characters and we had like four or five different themed haunt zones that we would you know interchange in between so there was like a wild west um it was like a retro 50 sci-fi so you had a lot of like your your aliens and like your men in black and a lot of like those types of like science fiction trope type of characters we had like a, car- a carnival uh, an evil carnival type of uh haunt zone and then we had like your classic like haunted hollows kind of on the on main street so you'd have like you know like your headless horsemen and your you know dead trick-or-treaters and your serial killers and your axe murderers and you had like zombie alley and stuff like that so a lot like the walking dead that type of stuff and yeah so i would just bounce around between all of those so i ended up developing a really odd roster of of silly characters that uh, i played either once or a bunch of times and yeah that's yeah that's kind of where i that's where i grew my love from that and what was the training like then so if you were being thrown from place to place doing loads of different things, like sure, yeah. I, I luckily, uh, luckily for me is that um, the like the the attraction that I worked at was the amusement park that I worked at was really um, it was part of a, a of a nationwide corp uh, company. So they had like they have parks like all over the United States, so, you know, like in the Northeast, Midwest, West Coast, in the everywhere in the middle. Um, so because of that, we had a lot more of a regimented um, standard of training than maybe like your independent haunts would have if you're just like a, if you're a self-starter, like or an independent, just doing yeah. your own thing. Um, and that was kind of good in a way where like you, you know, you're with a lot of people and you're just learning different, you're learning different ways. And a lot of it for me, like the stuff that stuck for me and that I ended up helping teach other people that were just learning is really the, um, the comfort of being silly. And or the, the comfort of just sitting in yourself and being comfortable being in a character, however that means to you, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, it's just yeah. finding ways of interacting with people in a way that's in character that makes you entertaining and but but also like makes you, you know, fulfill the need of being scary. And I also focus on the idea of scaring as a form of entertainment as a instead of like scaring as a form of harassment or torture or yeah. trauma. Like that's really not what you make the big bucks for. Cause if you give, you know, if you give someone, you know, you give, uh, you give a paying customers, you know, six year old kid trauma, they're not going to come back again. And they're exactly. Mad. Yeah. And that's really not what you're there for. I mean, we don't, we never, we were definitely explicitly trained uh, not to scare kids. Kids are not on the board. You scare the adults, you scare the people that want to be scared. You scare it in a way where like you, you can laugh after the scare. Basically, if you can't laugh after the scare, then you, then you're not, you know, you're only fulfilling part of that job and it's more of a sadistic aspect of that job that you really don't want to participate, participate in because it, you know, for the reasons I just said, it becomes less fun. And it's, I really liked the idea of um, scaring people, scaring people for fun because then it becomes much less of like a, an aggressive thing and more of just like an experimenting, like, like a joyous celebration. Type yeah, of thing yeah. If you want to get cerebral about so it. So I imagine but, it was yeah. quite playful in the sense that, you can play with what you had to do. Yes. Providing yeah, it was within lot, the yeah. realms of behaving. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I mean, and yeah, I mean, and I, from my experience is probably a little bit different because there, I mean, that's, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like haunt, haunted attractions. Uh, I feel like in a way are kind of like pizza places, like everyone, there's a million of them, but each one kind of does it their own different way. Uh-huh. So like, it's kind of difficult and like it all depends on like who's running the haunt and like what the goals are and some people you know they're definitely there to just scare you know scare the pants off of everybody or scare the heck out of whoever they can it doesn't really matter there's not a lot of roadblocks in there but because of the fact that we were part of a national a national recognized chain we didn't want to go hurting too many people or causing causing enough commotion where people were not having fun so for me, I have a lot more fun just scaring people and then having them laugh after. But there are definitely other institutions that are much more like, no, we're here to make you, you know, lose all your bodily functions and like have a heart attack and like, you know, fall over, you know, and I, you know, those are still on the table if you, but not, well, not the, not the heart attack thing. We can, I can, not that we'll strike that from the list. That's just, you don't want to do that. 
but but basically just scaring people in a way where it's just entertaining basically but there are a lot of other people that really like to go from like the hardcore like no you're in this is a nightmare you're in my world now which is that is a there's a flavor of it and there are people that like that um i was just not as part of that much of that hardcore scene as uh as other people are but i still respect it like if you know if you go in knowing what you're looking for it can still be a fun time but yeah yeah so i i've been to a few dungeon events over here and some it, there's been times where the actors have been quite scary so i guess yeah. i'm going to ask now was there ever a point when you went too far and if so how did you know you'd gone too far where yeah. where did you know the boundaries how did you understand where the boundaries were sure yeah i mean another part of the training and i'll even link that back to further answering the first question too with like training is that uh a lot of the training is about reading situations and figuring out when you're hitting, when people are hitting that threshold or just reading a situation where you can just tell that a person just really wants to have nothing to do with you. Cause that's part of being on a midway is that, you know, you can, you kind of can go a little bit harder on people when they've paid to go into an attraction. Like they know what they've signed up for, but it's a lot more of like, a, you really got to, you really have to read people and read body language yeah. and read, you know, read all the cues you can when you're out in the midway, because the last thing you want to do is, is, you know, scare someone that didn't, that, you know, it was just going, that was just showing up there to, to ride on a roller coaster. And they weren't really planning on meeting a carnival, a carnival worker with a severed head in his hand. So like that aspect, you can kind of, you can kind of get a general, a general read on someone for the most part. And thankfully for American audiences, we're pretty, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're pretty intense uh, and we're pretty upfront and pretty loud and boisterous, I think is our stereotype to proceed us as. So it doesn't, ha so when you're uh when, when you're a guest in a haunted attraction, those types of, uh, those types of behaviors kind of uh, bubble up to the bubble up to the surface. So like normally if someone doesn't want to have anything to do with you, they will be very audible and they will be very loud and let you know a lot of it being openly being threatening, being like, you come next to me, I'm going to punch you in the throat. You go, okay, cool. Well, that's good. I don't have to waste my energy on you. All right. You're already scared. You already don't want to deal with me. I'll find someone else. You know, um, other times there are issues where like, if you scare someone, uh, generally if you scare, if you're scaring someone and they're crying or if like they hit, like if they go fetal, if they hit the fetal position or if they just drop or if they're running and falling, you know, those are really the ones where you really want to slam on the brakes and be yeah. like, all right, this is becoming less safe. They go into protection um, mode type thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it, yeah. And a lot, I think a lot of people like, a lot of people, especially like in my experience, people that are new that are still trying to find the sweet spot of like how to get a good, good scare. Like they're just like, oh, I got a scare. Like I really want to like, I really want to amplify that, the result on that and not realizing that by doing that, you're actually making it worse. Um, like you're, you've taken it from a fun, happy, ha ha thing to a, I need to talk to your manager. Like this, somebody just got hurt. Like we need to get, we need to take someone to the med, you know, to the medic tent or whatever. So that it, there really is a matter of drawing that line and being like, you know, sometimes you have people that are like, oh, I'm not scared. Or, you know, the, the people that you want to scare are the people that will come up to you being cocky and be like, what? You're not scary. And you're like, oh, OK, you're my new target. You're my new project until you decide to leave me alone. All right, fun. And then that becomes more of like the game that you can have with people, um, you know, until they get too obnoxious. And then you got to you got to deal with it other, another way. But generally speaking, um, I've been I've really become comfortable in like. If I scare someone and they get a laugh or like, you know, there's, there's, they're like, Oh man, you got me or whatever. I'll tend to leave it at that. Um, if, if I, if I feel like someone's quavering in their voice or if they're pleading or if they're begging or if their bodily posture changes, or if like you see them like tense up or curl or like react in a way where it's just like, Oh, you're, you're having a response to this. That is not, that is not one of enjoyment then I tend to peel off or I'll actually switch from depending on what kind of character I'm playing. I will instead switch being an aggressive character to then being an engaging character as in like, you know, where I would normally just be like, Hey, how's it going? Like I'd run up and be like, Oh, Hey, are you okay? Like what's going on? You know, how's it going? You know, that yeah, type yeah. Of thing. so if you can change your intensity and your emotional content to, instead of you can go from being a monster to just a character, a goofy character. And once again, that's where the, comfort in being silly comes to help you diffuse that situation um that's where that comes into play I and mean, that's definitely where like the area that i came from because i definitely came from like an improv comedy background used to being very silly for you know being paid to be silly or also doing it for free or most of the time 
doing it by accident. That was my entire high school career. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of where I was able to kind of that's kind of the my sweet spot that I dwell in, and I'll also scare people as well. Yeah. But, yeah. So I mean, that's what I was going to say. It takes a lot of emotional intelligence to understand what's happening in front of you. But then I guess on the other side of the coin, I know when we see clips online and we're like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't stand for that. I'd I'd be doing this and I'd be doing that. Has there, yeah. ever, has there ever been a time when something's happened that from the other side, like from participants, like they've gone awry, they've gone over the boundary? Yeah. What's tell? Is is anything like that ever happened? Yeah, and I'm actually going to show my. I haven't told you how old I am, but I'm going to show my age just right here because I'm like in the last five years up until like I kind of semi retired from haunting in 2018. Um, I was just working, like, I just, all of my focus had shifted to my art career, so I was doing a lot more stuff there, and it just made more sense for me to focus on that, but I'm still very much close friends with all the people that I do haunt work with, and I'm always, always very quick to help anyone if they ever come to me with, like, haunt questions, but over the last five years, um, get, I mean, guests can get really riled up, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people think like, and especially at least at, at least from the horror stories that I've heard um, from my from my friends at work there, that um, you know, a lot of the times there's a there's an odd like the customer's always right mentality where it's like, oh, I paid twenty five bucks to be in here, I have every right to punch the guy that I don't like or or like you know or bop the person that whatever or be cruel to the people because I don't want to be scared and you can di- you can dissect the psychology of that being like I'm trying to control the situation so I'm trying to control my space. I don't want to be messed with. So in order to do that, I'm going to overcompensate by being aggressive to the people I literally just paid to give me a good time. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's not a lot. And so, and you know, when those people, those times happen, or you just have a lot of people that just like to be like, Oh, I'm smarter than these guys. Like I, I'm, I'm better than all these guys. I'm above it all. Like I can look at me. I'm going to scare the guy that's scaring me. Like, look how good I am. I should be doing this. So you get all those types of characters out there. And you just have people that just live in the chaotic energy and just like, Oh, look at me, try and trip this person or whatever. And then typically <clears throat> based on my experience, once again, you don't want to do that at a big uh, haunted, uh, in a big haunted theme park, just because there's a lot of security and they will be the first people to tell you to get the heck out. If you, if you do that. Um, but also there is just a lot of like, even at the amusement parks where like to get, to get like a beer is like prohibitively costly. We still get, we used to still get people that would be just be drunk or under the influence of something and not, and just having a good time, but also just completely belligerent and just messing with people or the worst thing like we've had we've, or getting handsy. Like there'll be people that'll just be like, you know, thinking that they're going to try and, you know, they think the guy that's trying to scare them is flirting with them and they'll try and cop a feel or like, or like ask him out on a date or like, you know, go about it another different way being like, how do I, you know, so that becomes those things I've heard have ramped up a little bit, but generally speaking, um, they're just things that happen. But, for, but I argue that um, the thing that I always used to do in order to combat that is that uh, is kind of like what I was talking to before is like learning how to be a character and learning how to be entertaining when you're not necessarily doing something. Yeah. Like I can, I can walk from, I can walk like a hundred feet in one direction and not be messed with. Um, and that's because I can walk in character work. I have a, I have a goal. I'm doing something. I'm showing people that I'm walking where it, people can look at me and go, Oh, it looks like this person looks like they're doing something. It looks like they're part of a show. Um, whereas opposed to which, you know, sounds kind of silly, but when when you break it down like that, because I've seen other people where, you know, I've had conversations with people that are like, oh, people keep, keep messing with me. I'm like, well, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm just hanging out on the side and I'm looking and I'm like, and I'm hiding in plain sight waiting to like scare people that are looking at me. I'm like, that's cool. But guess who's looking at you? The people that the, you're, you're not looking at the people that are looking at you. You need to be putting on a show. Like it's, a, it's part of your performance. Yeah. You really got to you know, get, let people know that what you're doing is a performance. Yeah. And when they engage with you and recognize that you're performing, then they'll watch you instead of thinking, Oh, you're not doing anything. I'm going to participate to try and make the performance good. Yeah. Like you have to eliminate that up uh, right off the bat. That's an, an unspoken dialogue sometimes for participants. Like if you're not yeah. what we used to call owning your space, if yeah. you're not owning your space, somebody f- like somebody thinks that's a message that mm-hmm. they have to do something to activate the performance. Yeah. Like, like it's, yeah, it's a fine yeah, line it's sometimes. Like, yeah. 
yeah no that's a great way of putting it like i don't uh I, I, you have halloween like in the united states we have like halloween spirit shops they overtake every empty strip mall in america come september and they always have like the what you're talking about like you have like they'll sell like you know kind of like the haunted attractions like oh push the button and watch the thing pop up like that's kind of like i think a lot of people i think you've rightly ascertained that some people think that like oh if this person isn't doing anything oh, maybe I have to, like, push the button in order to work, so. Yeah, because, I mean, I was part of some promenade theater. If you've, have you ever heard of promenade theater? So um, no. It's essentially, it's it's a show that moves around venues, and the audience oh. moves with you, but they nice. don't know when to move unless you're mm-hmm. communicating to them in character that they should be moving without saying, yep. it's time to move. Um, awesome. And that's, I mean, especially if like participants of shows like yours have gone yeah. to any of those types of shows before, mm-hmm. they misunderstand the signs. Yeah. And I would imagine that's yeah. probably where the confusion sometimes happens, really. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I, and it's funny you mentioned that because I, on some of like, I was lucky enough to work at my amusement park for a number of years where we had like a stellar cast of just just bonkers people like in the best way possible like we would just get together and maybe like all right what do you guys want to do okay we're gonna we're gonna be a traveling freak show or a carnival and we would just you know we'd get like three or four people and then we would walk from like han zone to han zone like doing show kind of like a very a very rudimentary version of what you're explaining with your promenade because i was like oh i know exactly what that is i just never engaged in it in that way yeah so like yeah i played a lot of characters i think one of them was like uh, my first year that i did a collaborative thing is that i wanted to be um i i wanted i, I wanted to be like you know like the uh, the monkey in the organ grinder like that kind of archetype of a character um my, one of my friends has like a brilliantly twirled mustache and very like snidely snidely uh Snidely Whiplash kind of character, and he had like an organ grinder, like a little box with mu- like a music box that he would turn, and he attached um, reclaimed animal bones that were okay. sanitized to it to make it very ornate. He'll play this horrible music, and then uh, I spent a couple years dressed up like as like a monkey, uh, like there was like a, there was like a gorilla outfit, so I was kind of like the gigantic like you know dancing for a change in the midway and stuff like that, and that was uh, paired up with like a bunch of other people that would do like. You know, I had a friend that was like a contortionist and we had a couple other friends that were like, you know, snake oil salesmen. And there was like a whole thing. We would tour around the haunt zones and stuff like that. And that would just be like a weird thing we would just do for one night. And then, yeah, but it it was, they were really fun. But also like at at my age now, I can't imagine doing it again because I would, I would, I would collapse after 15 minutes because my knees aren't, my kneecaps aren't what they used to be. (laughs) So for anyone who's auditioning for this type of role then to get through that, whether it's a workshop audition or whether it's just an audition, what mm-hmm. advice would you give to people to get through that process more effectively? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So two things, uh, being able to communicate, like I would say communicating um, the ability to present and emote and kind of uh, convey things, even if you're not sure what they are, like if you, you know, just uh, show a uh, demonstrate an ability to commit to something even if it's even if it's not necessarily what they're looking for, showing that you have the capacity to kind of, you know, lose your inhibitions, just kind of become whatever it is that's being asked of you to the best of your ability. And which shows that, you you know, you have the ability to kind of to invest and kind of uh, concentrate your intent into a specific thing to just go there. That is really important. Um, and. And, and most people can say, because th- just as long as you have that intent and that capacity and that enjoyment of it, that can be directed otherwise, which brings it to the second part, be open to direction. So it's like, if you go in thinking like, oh, I'm going to do this character and this is exactly what's going to happen. And then, you know, if you're rigid in how you're being directed, because, you know, sometimes if you go in, you might not be playing the same character for a month and a half. Sometimes you might be bounced around or helping people out. Um, so it helps you to be flexible. Um, it, definitely embrace the idea of improv and then also just embrace the idea of, of just accepting and taking um, notes and, and direction. So those are really like the big things. So like, you know, this is very generic and I can't say it for every single process that I've been to, but the ones that I have been to is that when you audition, you either do a walk or you read a spiel, you, you just do, you, you are asked to perform something, either it's on the spot or something that's written, depending on what you're applying for. 
and you just go for it. So it's like, you know, welcome to the haunted hell, you know, welcome to the haunted hayride of Hell's Valley. Welcome, come on over here. Don't step too close. You know, you just pick a direction and go with it. Um, and it's just the most people are just looking for if you have the capacity for you know, focusing on like developing a character or developing something that sounds interesting or a cadence or whatever, and being able to hold that and being able to play in that. Um, but then also if somebody goes, Hey, that was really cool what you said, but can you say that again, but be more like, um, be more like piratey with it. You're, like, you're right. Mate. Welcome to the haunted hay ride of the haunted yeah. valley. Hey, come on over. Yar. You know, that type of thing. So as long as you can, as long as you are good and comfortable with playing and then also accepting direction, like those are going to be the things that'll really get you there. Yeah. So, I was yeah. just about to say about the play side of it, because I think before you go into that process, you have to play around with every option first, really. Oh yeah. So that you're not surprised by it. Like, whereas a standard audition for a, a character in a part, mm -hmm. you make you make all those decisions first and they either like it or they don't. You just have to like it or lump it. But yeah. with this type of thing, you have to be open to any possibility, really. Because you don't always get yeah. direction in, in auditions. But when it's yeah. this type of role, I guess you need to have all that playtime first so that no matter what, yeah. what happens, you're ready for it. Yeah, I mean, another thing that, like, once again, if, if you're younger, it's, it becomes less applicable. But as you get a little bit older, you really want to make sure that you're really comfortable and, like, have a strong core, like, you're, you're physically, like, you, your physicality is, is up to par where it's, like, you know, like, you don't want to push yourself too far or you want to know where your physical limitations are as an actor, just in general. And that's regardless of age or experience or whatever. Just know what you can do. And then know that when you can experiment where your limits are, where like, okay, if I try and do this for like four hours a night, then I'm going to end up in the hospital. You know, you really want to know that. You don't want to find that out through through bad experimentation yeah. on the job. Like that's the last thing you want. Um, so it really is a matter of being like, all right, I know that I can do this and I can do this and I can sustain this for X number of times and stuff like that. But it's all like different skill sets for as well. Like, being a midway monster is a different, a completely different brand of operating than you would be if you were in a in a in a haunted attraction, like a walkthrough. Because of the fact that, like in a haunted attraction walkthrough, you have generally you have like your space, your area, which can be a room or like a section of a house, and you're this one designated character, and you can go in bursts. Like you don't have to be in character all of the time, but it's it's more along the lines of like like that's I I learn more. Um, it, cause you can, you can, it can afford you the time to experiment a little bit more when you're in a haunted attraction, because you are just going through and you're testing things out and you're engaging with people like, you know, groups of people on the hour, like five, six, seven groups every, you know, half an hour, 30 minutes or so. So like, you can have the chance of being like, you know, Oh, let me try this. Or, yeah. you know, that's where we were experimenting. Like the risks are a little bit lower. Um, but you can also like, you figure out that's where you can figure out where, where you can like play with your buttons in a more of a controlled environment. Whereas with midway monsters, like on the midway, you're in character for a much longer time and you're 360. So you really got to have your head on a swivel eyes on the back of your head. Like that's the stuff where your awareness and your energy level have to be like really up. Um, it, you know, and not to, you know, not to put one on a pedestal or above the other. It's just, it just requires different skill sets. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And in, in a haunted attraction, it's really more along the lines of like consistency you build your consistency and you build like your experimentation in that consistency a lot better. That's like your, that's like your crash course if you've never done it before. And then when you get that comfort, then you can go out in the midway. Um, but it's just, they're just two different, they're just two different monsters, literally. Yeah, literally. That's some amazing advice. Uh, and I'm sure that's going to help loads of people there. So let's I'm now so. jump behind the scenes and look, sure. uh, or let me ask about, the, your makeup background so yeah. when did you learn makeup what was the process that got you there yeah once again it was kind of like um the the same crew like once they like i kind of joked about it earlier but it's it's genuinely how it happened where they were like hey like you know how to draw like you're getting your degree in fine arts or in illustration have you ever drawn on a face and i and i genuinely had not so okay. i asked and then like my luckily the the makeup crew that I met um, was run by a lot of was run by a, a lot of really really cool weird people just like me. So it was really nice. Like um, I always joke that like my first like 
you know, a lot of sometimes people will be like, you're, you know, you're, the, your time in school or like high school from when you're from like, you know, your formative years from like 14 to 18, whether that's like primary school or high school, whatever region you want to call it. Um, every, a lot of people like romanticize that being like, oh, those were the days. Like my, like, those were the days where my time spent, um, which a little bit later was when I was in college or university. Um, like, so I was a little bit of a late bloomer in that regard, but that's cause I found my people that I could have fun with. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like the first person I met that ran the makeup room, he taught me how to run a, uh, an airbrush, uh, like my, my first airbrush. And, uh, and I, then I managed to keep going and, you know, uh, me and like a squad of like eight people would paint between two and 300 people a night. So you'd get, you get real quick, just like hammering them out real fast. So like 15 minutes of face. You normally do like between 10 to 15 faces a night if, if it's a really good night and if things weren't getting like getting real bad out there. So, but yeah, so that's kind of like, that's kind of where I learned. It was just kind of like just being crash course and just uh, being, uh, being adept at it. The fun thing is that most airbrush guns, I don't have mine on me right now, but like, this is more like a weird thing is that um, most people use their, their forefinger to like control the airbrush. Cause like you, you, the airbrush, if you've ever seen one, has like a little button that you can push down and then it's it's heater side and side to control the amount of paint that comes out of it. Yeah. For me, I use my thumb because I played video games for so long and I played PS2, which had the two thumb drives. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like I got my control for line weights was so good because I've been like, dude, I played last of us for like, <laughs> for like, you know, for like two years, man, I got this down pat. I can walk. The perfect transition. Walk <laughs> yeah. Do you want to walk or run? I can do both and everything in between. So yeah. And did you do prosthetics as well? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Did, uh, yeah. Like old school, old school where like, I mean, we've, we never made our own prosthetics. Although by the time I left, um, people were making their own like prosthetics proper, but I was much more of like the sculpted, like, uh, we would just, you know, uh, liquid latex, um, paper towels, cotton balls. That's kind of really all the stuff that I really needed to get done. What I needed to get done because all it is, is just, um, because especially with like in the haunt industry, um, this is like kind of a weird thing too. Is that a lot of the actors will be like, "Oh, I'm gonna get makeup. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look like I'm on Face Off, and it's gonna be amazing, and it's gonna be like Universal Studios." I'm like, "You're gonna be a zombie with like three slapped ashes of blood on you. Your people are gonna. You're in a half lit area anyway. No one's gonna see anything. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna make you look good, but I can't. I can't make you. You know, you're not gonna get a." You're not going to get an Emmy nod anytime, yeah. anytime soon, you know. So it's got to be made for efficiency. So it's that means you just learn learn how to uh, throw on a base coat, learn how to sink in the eyes, sink in the cheekbones, kind of sink in the fore, you know, the uh, furrows in the brow. Know where to create the lines, the lines to create age or create like the emotion spots. Know how where to highlight. We have some texture stuff, and then a lot of it is just like. You can do just a, a just a slap dash of um, liquid latex. Let that dry over an edge. Throw some cotton balls in it. Split the cotton balls, and then there's your gash. You just fill yeah. that with blood, and that's just as simple as you need to go. Another big point for actors is that if you can avoid it, try and make sure that the gashes you put on your actors make sure that the blood doesn't tr trickle immediately into their eyes. I have a big weird crow magnet brow with like gigantic honking eyebrows, so blood doesn't bother me. But for people that like I know people that like they, they just can't. It'll just go right into their right into their tear ducts. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to blind you, but it'll feel really unpleasant. So, the best thing to do is just if you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, you know, get the get the get the get the gashes around the nose or the face. You want to make it prominent because this is such a billboard for most yeah. people. Like, get it to start and then make sure that the blood pools off to the side and then trickles down. That's that's like your big points if you have someone that's like because you the last thing you want is to be like oh I'm. I'm like acting like a I'm acting like a madman in the middle of the woods at you know at nine o'clock at night. I better not run into a tree because I got something because my eyes sting. <laughs> yeah, so there was no like massive Mothman prosthetics or anything, no. <laughs> no, no, not yet. I mean, goodness gracious, man, if I could though. Oh boy! But Mothman, I tell you, Mothman, yeah, Moth them, Moth they, whatever you want. <laughs> that's the perfect lead into the next segment. Then, so we're going to talk about Mothman. Um, yes, and please. And I've just mentioned Mothman, but some people who's listening, you guys might be thinking, "What on earth is Mothman?" So let's just <laughs> kick it off. What is Mothman? How sure. did this? start uh sure yeah i can give you a little bit of a rundown um mothman is an american based uh 
cryptid of folklore. You know, we were kind of touching base on on cryptids earlier, but uh, Mothman, specifically Mothman, um, as he's appeared in the in the 1960s in a place called Point Pleasant, West Virginia, um, and it's one of the it's one of the major sightings and is part of a collection of odd odd documented reports that happened in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in, in I want to say 1968 to 1969, um, involving a humanoid creature with wings with glowing red eyes. And um, it, it was it was sighted a number of times in an area called the TNT area. Um, I'll try and truncate everything because it's a lot. Like there's like a two and a half hour documentary called Eyes of the Mothman. If you can track it down, it used to be on Netflix. I don't know where it is now, but it is a wonderful documentary. It's like two and a half hours long it's well worth the watch if you're really into it um, i'm going to cite a lot of things from there but basically uh, mothman was a like i said a, a humanoid flying creature uh, estimated to be between six and seven feet tall with like a 10 foot wingspan uh, so pretty large creature um, it was located in what is called the tnt area of point pleasant west virginia where it was first uh spotted uh, which was uh a it was a long abandoned weapons munitions facility that was used to storage munitions during World War II. And it had since been, you know, compromised. It was chemicals. There was a lot of um, like a lot of contamination, like from pollutants and stuff like that in the water. So but it was like the cool place where all the cool kids would hang out in, in you know, the 1960s. They would go, you know, smoke cigarettes and talk about rock and roll music or whatever they did. As you do. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there were two couples, and unfortunately their names are uh, evading me, but there were two couples that had driven in, driven down to the TNT area um, late at night to party, like I said, to hang out. They see Mothman, and this is like, a, a, this was like a, on a police report. You could find this report. It's, it's very real, like it was documented. They drive through uh, Point Pleasant into the TNT area. They see this large creature, as I described, in the middle of the road. They turn around and drive back into town, hitting speeds of 100 miles per hour. And they're looking back at this creature. The wings aren't moving or flapping. They're just staying so They're staying the same, like it's gliding. But it's still keeping up at 97, and it's scratching the roof, the hood of their car. You know, very, very horror movie-esque type of thing. Um, so they leave. And they they managed to lose it and they're looking at each other and they're like did we actually just see that and like they, we couldn't though so we so they decided to drive back to the tnt area again and saw it again you know like it was kind of like it, like it was almost like bobby was still hanging out being like oh you're coming back round two all right let's go they freaked out again went to the police uh and they went to the police the police officers went and came uh came with them and by that time when the police showed up then it had scattered because it was enough, you know, more than one car, you know, whatever, or however. But from that major report, that is the report that hit that uh, got nationwide coverage. And there was another gentleman involved. Like there was a weird year long period in Point Pleasant. There was a lot of paranormal activity being reported. Mothman was the biggest one. But then there was also um, sightings of like extraterrestrial beings. There was like reports of um of lights in the sky so much so that like everyone in town would be like, Oh, it's Thursday. It's time to see the purple lights in the sky. Let's go out in the field and go check them out. We don't know what they are, but boy, they sure are pretty. You're like, wow, that's intense. And um, so it, it became like a national, um, it became a national thing. And uh, I think it's linked to Mothman is a guy by the name of Indrid cold, who is considered to be, um, he's a cryptid in the way that he's called the grinning man. He's described as being a human that looks very much like us, but he talked to this gentleman by the name of Woodrow Derenberger, who is a uh, he was a salesman, and he inter and he interacted with this character by the name of Indrid Cold, and he allegedly took him to his home planet of Lanulos, and he went on like a national television and reported this. Like he explained, he, there was like a whole town hall that was you can look up the television reports of this story being told to like town hall. And it was broadcast all across. You can YouTube it. I found it myself. And one of the most chilling lines from that is that um, Andrew Cold said hi to me. He goes, hello, we don't mean you any harm. We eat, we sleep, we breathe, we bleed like you do. Like that's like the line that Ingrid Cold told Woodrow. Um, so that was happening at the same time that the Mothman was happening. But basically all Mothman actually, for any of you who are big comic book nerds, uh, Mothman got his name because of Batman. Um, because uh, in the string of sightings of Mothman that happened after the uh, after the car account that I told you about, Mothman was spotted hundreds of times uh, um, uh, weekly 
Um, and one of the reports that came in, someone says, hey, I don't know what to tell you, but there's Batman on the roof of my barn. And he just took away and he just took off and flew into the, into the night. And they couldn't call him Batman because, you know, licensed character, you know, be a lot of legal problematics doing that. Yeah. So, but however, there was, uh, I believe at the time, there was, they had just debuted a character because it was around like 1966. So like Adam West Batman. And I believe they had a character called Killer Moth. So they decided to go with Mothman instead. Um, but this character had many, many interactions with human, with like, with human beings working in town. The men in black were reported there. It's one of the most prominent um, times of, of men in black in, in sightings and in interactions were like, you know, there were reporters for the for the Point Pleasant um, Observer, I believe was the name of the publication, where they where like men in black would show up and like intim- physically like intimidate people being like, don't talk about this. Don't tell anyone about this. And it was very bizarre. So but yeah. And then the so I, to, to kind of put a button on all this is that everything kind of rose to a rising action until I believe it was Christmas in, in December of 1969. Um, a bridge in Point Pleasant collapsed, and I believe 49 people died. So, um, you know, and this is a very real, like, it's an actual documented occurrence. Like, it's all in the record books. Like, this actually happened. Um, and when uh, when this happened, all, all the Mothman activity kind of disappeared. But there was also a lot of alleged, uh, alleged allegations that Mothman was sighted on the side of the bridge prior to its collapse. Like, it was like this creature that was on the side of the bridge so it kind of got lapsed into it but once when that happened everyone kind of got shook from like you know it's such a traumatizing and horrifying event that happened to real human beings that you know kind of like the the fantastical elements uh the kind of was replaced with the severity and seriousness of it so so it's kind of one of the weird things where like a lot of you know a lot of cryptids in america or a lot of cryptids in general just have like these anecdotal stories but mothman in particular is very it is very prominent because of the fact that it is linked to like, it is linked to the historical documentations of loss of human life. Um, there's, that is not, you don't normally see that a lot when you talk about like Bigfoot or, you know, or like Thunderbird or Skinwalkers or something like that, or, or, you know, how, ex, you know, insert name, insert name. So, but yeah, that's kind of like where, where Mothman came from. And a lot of people, you know, I've, there, there have been Mothman sightings recently too. So people consider like, there are a lot of people that think certain things. A lot of people thought Mothman was like either an angel or another dimensional being trying to like be a harbinger of either change or truth or try to be like, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of what Mothman was, but that's basically what Mothman was. But gigantic red glowing eyes was very huge, was the biggest thing. So much so that like people that had close encounters with it uh, reported to have suffered radiation burns. Um, or they would they would they would contract conjunctivitis. Um, yeah, it was it, it was it was it was gnarly. But yeah, but that's that's basically in Mothman in a nutshell. So it's a lot. So what's he <laughs> what was what did he have to gain from like chasing people? What was it? Yeah, it was well. The, one of the well, the big thing about the reports uh, of the firsthand reports from witnesses say that the Mothman, whenever they would engage with it, is that it it behaved in a curious nature where it. Um, you know, it, it seemed to have an intelligence, but it just didn't. It was like, um, like you took a. It, it, I guess if this is going to be a very rude, off the cuff comparison, so forgive me if it falls on its face. But it's like, it's like picking up, it's like picking up an anteater and putting it in an arcade. In an arcade, it just goes. It it it's a place, and it knows that it's in a room, but it doesn't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it has to like figure. It's poking around, being like, "What the heck is this? Is there an ant in this? No, that's where you put quarters." You know, it's kind of like. It, it it's it behaved in that it was like yeah. it behaved in a way where it just did not understand i think that's worse because yeah it makes it like completely uneasy like anything yeah. is possible anything could happen i just hate it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like, it must be coming out of the woodwork because he knows we're talking about it <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i mean well i mean if you talk to if you talk to the old school residents i mean now there's there now there's a mothman festival that happens every single year in point pleasant but yeah, that's because, you know, and that's been going up for like 10 or 20 years. But for like the five or 10 years after that, if you were to go to Point Pleasant in 1975 and ask about Mothman, most of the people, most of the residents that live there were so scared because a lot, because that was the other thing is that a lot of the people that witnessed it, they were all church going, like religious, God fearing folk. Like they did not, you know, they weren't trying to spin a yarn for headlines or anything. They were just like, as a very matter of fact, being like, look, 
I believe in God. I go to church every Sunday, but I saw this happen and I don't know what this is. Can yeah. someone help me? What's going you know, on? That's what made it. Yeah. That's where kind of like the tragic part of it came through. And there was one instance where um, there was a very close encounter with it. There was a woman who was driving uh, to her house. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I'm botching the, uh, the specifics of it, but there's a, pre- there was a woman who had just had her, her newborn baby um, visiting a friend who um, it was late at night. And Mothman was on the roof of her friend's house. And she was so scared that she dropped her newborn child, picked it back up again, ran into the house to be with her friend. And the, the baby was fine, thank goodness. Um, but when they got inside the house, they locked the door. But it was like an old, it was like an old colonial like house where like a lot of the windows are out in the front. There's a gigantic porch that like cir- that circles like outside. And according to the reports, these two women like you would see Mothman, they, they reported seeing Mothman like stalking the windows, looking inside it, just trying to like figure out like, why can't I get in here? Like, what's going on? Like, who are you? Like it was, they described it as having that. That's where that curious nature um, was reported. And that's where kind of like that also added to it. But yeah, pretty, pretty gnarly. Yeah. Pretty gnarly. That's stuff. horrendous. Just the idea yeah, yeah. that. Oh, I, oh. oh yeah. I've seen. I saw the the film, The Mothman Prophecies, in two thousand and two, yep. about 20, 20 years ago. Um, yep. Who was it? Richard Gere, I think, wasn't yes. it? Yeah. So oh, yeah. I saw that, and I remember it being really scary. But I think I might need to go back and watch that now. Um, I, I rewatched. Yeah, I rewatched it recently. Like it for the most part, it still holds up. Like the, I mean, the graphics are like it's an early two thousand, so like the graphics are kind of like meh, but like. The, the the points that are scary, I think, for the most part, still hold up. But the way you just but, yeah. described that story, mm. it re- it resembled Jeepers Creepers. Oh yeah, with the guy with yeah, the wings uh, the flying. flying. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that's Absolutely. what popped yeah. into my head when you described that. But oh, sure. it's just the idea of it petrifies me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then, I th- I think I was going to ask you then. Would you recommend any like books? You well, you've recommended your documentary about it. I think that's sure. a, a good one for the listeners to go to if they want to find out more yeah. about that. That's a good one. I mean, good, classic literature. Um, oh no, I'm gonna forget his name. I shouldn't. I shouldn't though. Um, so I can recommend two things in different mediums as well that are a little bit more that should be a little bit more accessible. There's the book that the, there's the book that the movie is based off of called The Mothman Prophecies, and it was written by a reporter that worked with all of these ca- people. Um, Frank Verzetta, uh, actually did, painted the, um, painted the cover for it. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's one of those things, like, I think if you saw the cover, you'd be like, oh, right. Of course, Frank Verzetta painted that. And fun fact for that as well is that, are you familiar with Frank Verzetta, the, the illustrator? I'm not. No. He, that's okay. He's, he was a big, he was a big painter for like, he did a lot of stuff for like heavy metal magazine and Conan the Barbarian and, um, Pathfinder and stuff like that. Okay. So like very, you know, like if you see his stuff, you'd be like, oh, right, that guy. Um, but like he painted the cover for this, for the Pro- Mothman prophecies. And it's very cerebral and out there. Um, and Mothman, he's commemorated. They made a Mothman statue in Point Pleasant. And it's a gigantic silver statue that's about like 10 feet tall. It's very insect-like. It has these magnificent wings. But if you turn around to the back, some jokester in the back decided to give him the biggest, the biggest uh uh, backside of ever you've ever seen in the in the in the history of sculpture i promise you like so much so that like it, that it like people will go and visit and will put coins and change in the crack like this they're trying to like scan a credit card not i'm not sure i'm sure not the intent of why they did that but it's hilarious <laughs> sculptures um i've got a lot to answer for because we've yes. got um there's one in glasgow i'm not in glasgow i'm in england but there's a I can't remember who it is now, but there's a statue in, we always say students because we used to do it when we were students, but we get a traffic yep. cone and we put it on top of this guy's head who's sitting on a horse. Yep. And <laughs> all these years later, people still do it. It's just, of course, it's been done for like forever <laughs> and people just carry on doing it. Um, it's the right, it's, that's that's what that's how we get modern day tradition. That's literally, the right of the yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh, and also, yeah, and also, there's a really good um, YouTube. Uh, there's a, a Mothman adjacent um, YouTube series called by Planet Weird called uh, called Hellier, and it's a re- it's really it's done really really well. It kind of like um, it's part documentary, but also part like um, 
paranormal uh, paranormal fiction okay um where like it's it's all handheld uh but it's just really well done they have two seasons of it but they pretty much are inspecting um hopkinsville goblins in kentucky which is kind of part of appalachia which is a huge part of american folklore where like a lot of scary stuff happens um but it is also as the series progresses it becomes more and more linked towards both the mothman and ingrid ingrid cold they become components to the story as it unfolds so if you you know it's I think the first season is like eight episodes or about like 45 minutes a piece. And then season two, they have 10 and they're about the same length. So it's, you know, it's about a Netflix show, but they're well worth it. You can look them up online, Planet Weird, really good stuff. Brilliant. And you were talking a second about um, illustrations as well. So yeah, you're an artist as well, aren't you? So what's enamel yeah. pins, you do sculpture yourself, um, toys yeah. and fine art and illustrations. I, I mean, personally, I went and had a look. I've seen your 3D works and I, I love them. Um, Oh, thank you. So how long have you been working on these skills as well? Sure. Yeah, I, I've been drawing ever since I was a little kid. Basically, the joke that I always like to say is that once my parents found out I could draw and I wasn't causing property damage, they were like, yeah, just do that. Just do please. that instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we can't we can't replace. We can't. We have to stop replacing things in the house. Just, just please take this, you know, drawing paper and just draw whatever you want. Started with Teenage Ninja Turtles because I was you know, born in, you know, product of the 80s and classic all the classics you know that type of deal but then um as i grew up and you know like i said got my got my degree in graphic arts uh, i'm sorry an illustration from university of connecticut and then i would say i have reached I, I really like hit this new plateau i almost retired during the pandemic in 2020 i was just so like i was just trying to deal with a bunch of stuff and then thankfully for me like in 2021 i woke up uh in february of 2021 i woke up in a cold sweat and filled out an entire drawing a drawing book and basically like an hour of just little these little ideas and those ideas then became my first enamel pen series oh bro so um yeah i'm very lucky in that and uh you know that i didn't i tried quitting and i and it didn't take so um so yeah like i do a lot of uh, i've been i've spent this past year because i turned 40 and if you were if you really hold on to how old is this is this weirdo <laughs> i am 40 years old i decided to crush 40 so i've been spending this past year just um basically Drawing to my heart's content, I produced two art books. I produced one in April, and I produced one um, just recently. Actually, hold on. This is the per for my first public showing. These are uh, this was kickstarted um, in April. This is Gord Folk Fest Volume One. It's a collection of illustrations I did leading up to Halloween, and like you know, you're kind of steampunk Victorian, and then you have like class yeah. clowns and. And you got your one just you know having a pumpkin spice coffee or a beer just hanging out that's great so i do i drew 60 of these these are in a 30 page book um kickstarted it and i'm going to be doing fulfillment uh, in about a month from now because i ordered a bunch of new pens too but i've designed like a dozen pens and then um and i my other series of work i did is called uh surreal estate which is just a bunch of artwork that's like um an homage to like my my irish my irish ancestors uh like get uh, gothic and, and gaelic folklore type of stuff with like fey homes and, uh, and mushroom houses and stuff like that so i just finished that and that's like 40 illustrations in um in a in a 40 page book so and i'm making more of those going into this year too but yeah that's so. great so tell us and the listeners where can we find your sites where can we go and check out your art tell us sure. all the links <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I really try to streamline it. Basically, if you just look up BK Artworks, all one word, that'll take you to my Instagram. That will that should point you at my coffee shop, my coffee shop. Um, and that's kind of where I do all my fun stuff. I mean, I have like a Facebook page, but it's not, I, it's not, it, it, I use my Facebook art page more so just like as a portfolio, basically. Like I use that just where when I'm done with everything else, I just kind of throw everything on that into like my photo albums. And that's kind of how that functions. But Instagram's where I'm most active. Reddit, I'm pretty active on there too. Um, but yeah, that's that's that, yeah, those are like the places where I go. So BKR works, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Well, that's amazing, Brett. And I know for me it's been really informative, regardless of how oh. freaked out I am by things like the Mothman. <laughs> <No apologies. laughs> um, and I think that is just enough for my Halloween, but I might actually go and watch a horror film now just to settle it. Uh, awesome just to make you, you just to make one, sure i can't sleep for the rest of the week <laughs> honestly i can suggest this one this one's my favorite because it is just a little bit of everything i watch it at least once every year it's mine it's trick or treat t a t r i c k hyphen r t r e a t because it's like it has it, it has everything that you want and you have a little bit of the scary you have a little bit of like the cutesy cold you know warm spirited it's not like 
it's not going to traumatize you, but it's it, it gives you everything that you want for like a good Halloween movie. When it comes to Halloween, I like to be traumatized. <laughs> okay, cool. Or well, horror then, uh, films, I like to be traumatized. <laughs> okay, good call. Well, then if you haven't watched It Follows, I would watch Color, Out or, uh, Color From Outer Space with Nicolas Cage. That's like one of my favorite movies that have come out in the last five years. Oh, I might go and watch that. I've not seen that yet. Oh, it's good. It's real good. It's, it's based off of H.P. Lovecraft's horror, uh, short story of the same name, The Color From Outer Space. It's real good. Okay, real. Well, it's been great to chat with you, and thanks again. Make sure, listeners, that you do go and check out Brett's work. Take my advice. You won't be sorry. Um, and don't forget to leave us a comment below telling us what your Hall Halloween celebrations are. And don't forget to like and subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode, and I will see you then. Don't get too scared this week. Boo. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>